Donc, bonjour, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're thrilled to welcome Adin Babkin and Paul Fournel for what we hope will be a riveting conversation on the 1919 Tour de France, cycling and riding. Uh, we are here to celebrate Adin Babkin's sprinting through no man's land and runs tragedy and rebirth in the 1919 Tour de France publication. The book is just out with little a. And we're very, very grateful to Paul Fournel, who's our great French expert on cycling, <laughs> for being able to join us today. So, and Paul Fournel, I will just quote one book. If you haven't read it, read Need for a Bike. It's available in English. It, is, it has been translated by Alan Stockel. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book about the experience of cycling and, and all the sensation it creates. And most of all, about brother, the feeling of brotherhood that, that uh, is, that's, uh, that, is um, that comes from being part of a peloton. So we are, first of all, we're very, we're extremely grateful to Susan Williams for her instrumental help in setting up this event. I will now briefly introduce our guests before letting them, uh, this, uh, letting, uh, letting them dwell into this conversation. So Adam Dupkin is a writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, among many other publications. Sprinting Through No Man's Land is his first book. Paul Fournel is a poet, a writer, a member of Ulipo, a collective avant-garde, uh, a collective of avant-garde writers whose works focus on the problem of puzzle and language, and he's a, a very estimated publisher. He's a former book department director at the French Cultural Services in Cairo, and in London. And more importantly, he's the author of more than 31 books for adults and many books for young readers. And we, among the books that we recommend by him, beside Need for the Bikes, there's also Enquetil Alone, uh, Les Athletes Dans Leur Tête, only available in French so far, and Les Cartes du Tour. So without further ado, I will turn the floor to our guests and wish you a lovely talk. Thanks for hosting, Paul, or thanks for chatting with me. <laughs> okay, so why did you pick 1919? I, I started this story as a novel thinking about an American soldier who was walking to Provence um, right at the end of the war. I had spent time there and had been from my own historical and magazine journalism background, really interested in that first moment after World War I ended when so many of those cultural movements, both in America and France and internationally, really had that first kind of kernel of birth when people were kind of, had just gone through this devastating war and were trying to think about, you know, what parts of the old world did they want to take and keep and which parts, you know, should be tried to build better. And um, when I was doing some research on the book, I came across the fact that the that year, um, the tour cyclists, I, I don't believe, oh, they did, they did ride, uh, I forgot if they rode Mont Ventoux uh, that year or uh, just uh, another year surrounding it. But I realized I hadn't really thought about those early years of the tour and how soon after the war ended would the race have occurred. And it was just seven months later. Um, and because of how Henri de Grange thought about the race, he wanted it to be as intense and as full and um, defining of, of, you know, the country of France at the time. And so he had the cyclists in his typical way kind of ride through the most intense landscapes that he could get them to ride through. And I thought that based on the, the place of the tour and its unique uh, fact of riding around the entire border of the country at that time, it would be an opportunity to talk about that changing border, the changing state of the country and how 
you know, France and, and Paris were kind of the capital of the world at the moment, just based on, you know, the influx of people and that mixing uh, and kind of thinking about what that future world could look like was really what drove me to write this story and then use the tour as an opportunity to have an exciting event that allowed these people who had just gone through the war to witness some of these yeah. moments. Yeah. But of course, uh, Desgranges wanted also to sell Lotto, his paper. Of and, course. Uh, you know, life was starting again and he needed to make money. Uh, and making money, you know, the Tour de France is, enough, you know, it's a good opportunity to make money when you run a magazine or newspaper like Lotto at the time. Um, but uh, of course, France was not exactly France. It was not the France of 1913 or 1914. So um, there was a challenge there. And I think that in your book, um, you describe very well the, the devastation of the country and, and the situation uh, of the country, which is uh, quite surprising how you know, how to run a race like Tour de France in such a landscape. Yeah, it is, um, you know, I think it is hard to separate the financial and economic interests with the place of the tour as something larger than a race at that time. Um, because of course for de Grange, there is this, um, financial element and, and, and the fact that by that point he was no longer just the the editor of the newspaper but the father of the Tour de France um, yeah. and he recognized and had a, a strong interest in keeping it that way um, and but for the people who watched it you know it was de Grange's aspirations for the race um, for all that they were grand, it still meant something more to those who watched the race. I think, you know, de Grange could only do so much on his own to kind of create this idea of a race that was something larger than a race. And I think that's well represented in this first year after World War I, where even in the events of the race itself, which, of course, de Grange only had a limited ability to affect, you have this kind of story of tragedy and triumph in Eugene Kristoff and and um and I think it really the events of the race happily align with kind of some of the struggles that people are are going through at the time which is um yes even the writers exactly because they uh, were not they were not exactly in shape they were not yeah, exactly yeah. trained they were just coming out of the trenches and, uh, you know, just, it was just immediately after the war, a few days after the war. And so um, this is very interesting to see how many of them had to quit the race because they were exhausted. Right. And, and you know, I, I think it, it, he says this quote later on in the 1919 race, but de Grange at some point said, you know, if, if only one cyclist is left uh, riding back into Paris, that will be, you know, the perfect Tour de France. And, and so it was, I, 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 he is an interesting character, particularly when we're thinking about some of the, the modern day challenges of the tour, where you have still have, you know, cyclists protesting for different reasons than they would have back then. But there's this, still this tension between those who run the race, those who watch the race, and the cyclists themselves, and how do you how do you balance the interest of those three groups? And I think you know, De Grange, it it he took a hard line stance, and and it ultimately worked out for him. But he pushed it to a breaking point. Uh, the yeah, cycle, absolutely, yeah. I think that at the very beginning there were about seventy riders. Yeah, about something like that. And at the end, there were only a few of them. Yeah. And, you know, facing struggles that people knew ahead of time in terms of the damage to the roads in the north, in the northwest or northeast, sorry, um, but also just health issues that were coming up as a function of not being able to train. It was really bad weather that year. And, um, and so it was a combination of bad luck and just this kind of merciless attitude of, of de Grange towards the cyclists in order to 
have the race be that kind of, um, well, you know, Roland Barthes called it, you know, the, an epic and, and kind of facing yeah. off against each other, but also the environment of France and, um, and really, you know, as long as, yeah, for him, you know, if one person could make it and they could put the, the, the general classification title on someone's name, then it was good with him. Yes. And what is interesting also is that the race was incredibly difficult, but the winner was not very spectacular. Yeah. And, and it, it does create this interesting dynamic at the end where... Yeah. The Grange calls calls Eugene Christophe the the moral winner of the race, with Fermin Lambeau, the the Belgian, as kind of the the de facto winner. Um, and uh, you know, Eugene wind, winds up uh, Christophe winds up winning, uh, or having you know tens of thousands of francs donated to him uh, by people who he rode past on the side of the road, or who his story meant something to, and. Um, I think it it speaks to one of the dynamics of the tour that is unique among sporting events is this kind of very close proximity between cyclists and those who watch them. I mean, I, I think, you know, even in form in, in Ancatil alone, you know, there's this kind of close proximity between you, the writer, and and the subject, and kind of almost right next to one another or like seeing through his eyes. And I think that's such an interesting and unique part about the Tour de France is that, you know, that, that, that physical closeness and emotional closeness between those who watch the race and those who ride in it. And um, yeah. I, 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 I think about the, the little one, the, the last one was left from the B group. Right. You know, there were two, two groups, two different groups of riders. There were the big ones, A group, and then there was the big group, which was the, you know, the amateur group. And uh, there was only one left at the very end. And everybody wanted him to succeed and to come to Paris to finish the tour. And so he, he was cherished by everyone, helped <laughs> as right. much as possible. Uh, that's a lovely, lovely character. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I, I'm curious if you have any theories on apart from you know do you think that that idea of these cyclists is kind of i mean characters or heroes i mean do you think it's just a function of how close people are to them i mean what do you think is the kind of that unique element of the tour that kind of breeds this relationship the, i think that the special relationship um in the tour de france relies in the fact that the tour de france is more than a race this is the only race in the world which is always more than a race. It's a story. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know the winner, you have, you know, 135 countries watching TV, watching, you know, France on TV before right. watching the Tour de France on TV and watching France. And so there is a link with the French people, which is very, very strong. People can wait for four or five hours along the road just to see the yellow jersey go pew, like this. And um, this is something quite special. You would not do that for another race, for example. Right. People, people do this because, because you know, th the idea, this was a fantastic idea. The Tour de France was a fantastic idea because there was France in it. And, um, you know, that's, that's big. Really, that's a really big thing. And... Um, um, you can, you can make the Tour de France. It's, it's not exactly round, but you can make the Tour de France. And at that time, they were going all around the, the country. So I think that there is a, a special link. And um, even in 1919, and 1919 was a um, very a major year, in fact, for the race because of the creation of the Maillot Jaune. You know, that was the first time they, they had the yellow jersey. Right. They had a, you know, they tried to do something before the war for the first time. There was, a, you know, a, a yellow jersey for a few days, but races were against right. yellow jersey because they, they looked like birds, you know, and they hated that and they didn't want to be the canary uh, right. of everybody. And so th this was a very important thing because uh, that, Yellow jersey is 
you know, big, bigger than a dream, even today. Right, right. And and I'm I'm curious, you know, to think about how the race will continue to look in the years ahead, um, because you know, so many of those elements. You, I think people's relationship to the tour has been changing just as a function of the international nature of it these days. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I, I, I'm always fascinated to hear really big cycling fans when they're talking about the race um, and don't really care who winds up winning because at, at least as an American, you know, we're so used to um, such loyalty to particular individuals or teams and whatnot. And, and the tour is this, unique thing that's almost like uh, the, the, the thing that draws people is like the stage itself rather than the actor who, who um, winds up coming onto it. Uh, and that, the, but there's still these great stories that kind of then exist within the context of the race itself. Like there, there are heroes of the Tour de France and it doesn't matter if they're known outside the tour because they, they did something great on the race itself. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And this is why you know, I think that you made a good choice. In fact, 1919 is not one of the most celebrated Tour de France, but obviously it's a very interesting one. And um, your book is very interesting because uh, it goes through, uh, you know, through all the, those um, stories. Uh, when, when you come up north to Alsace and Lorraine, this is very interesting because before the war, Alsace and Lorraine were German. But during all those years between 1903, when the Tour de France was created, to the war, the Tour de France was always going to Alsace and Lorraine, was always going to Strasbourg and Metz. And it was every time a big national French event even if it was Germany. And German people said, okay, fine. They didn't move on, on it. And so 1919 was something very special because for the first time, Alsace and Lorraine were French. And so that's what you, you tell. Even if the, the city is destroyed, even if riders cannot go through cities because they are totally muddy, uh, destroyed and uh, ruins here and there, but they, th this is very, very important for them to be there. Yeah, yeah, and and it and it you know gestures to, uh, you know when the when Lotto was founded, it was kind of as a an apolitical, uh, you know, sports daily. Um, yeah, right. But and 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 but you know, of course, that's not true. And and um, I think it just gestures to this really inseparable political relationship between of course. And the race and, and it still is <laughs> right um and uh yeah and 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 kind of so many of those political dynamics were you know just like the economic and and labor relations at the in 1919 were still very you know one of the the you know the lingering effects of world war one in particular was you know how it set the into motion, you know, what would wind up becoming World War II and, and kind of the, even, you know, today's international relations and um, de Grange and, and those who surrounded him have had, had a hand in kind of, or at least their philosophies and ideas um, helped define that time. And um, those were important to me to kind of yes. look at. Um, and it was, you know, the industry was restarting and the, you know, bike manufacturers were working very hard because they, have, they had been working on, a, on something else during the war. Of course, they were making shells or whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, and this is the reason why maybe he decided not to activate a high competition between the different brands. And um, it was decided in 1919, as you uh, tell in your books, that there would not be competition, team you know, they will not team 
Alcyon right. will not team against Peugeot, that we, it will not team against uh, Clément and so and so. And that was uh, very interesting to see that everybody was invited to grow and, and, and build again. Yeah, uh, you know, a, 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 a partially out of, you know, necessity and, and um, I do, I, it, it's funny to read that fact and then read um, how cyclists, the relationship between cyclists persisted and was then kind of tamped down by the rules, even against those, you know, very harsh conditions in terms of you know, rubber limitations and whatnot that still, you know, if you handed someone a water bottle, you were going to be fined 30 minutes uh, because, you and know. they did, and they did. <laughs> right. Of course, you, you know, if, the, if it's a rule, it's, uh, you know, DeGrange was going to follow it. And, um, and so it's this unique combination of, you know, on its surface cooperation and kind of towards a single purpose, but you know, DeGrange always wanted, you know, it, it was all about kind of creating that ultimate competition and, and, you know, any, at least back then, anything that would create cooperation between cyclists couldn't be allowed. So um, it's this, this dichotomy between, um, you know, everyone who was observing the race, having a, a unity of purpose, and then the cyclists still kind of needing to compete against each other kind of uh, on, on, in, very, uh, in a very strict sense of the word. Yeah. Uh, uh, at, at that time, there was, of course, no TV, no radio, and, and um, the, 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 the storytelling of the race was only in Lotto, the, the paper. Do you have an idea of the circulation of Lotto at that time? I, I, I have um, some pre-war numbers and, and, it, and it fluctuates a lot. Um, I don't have the numbers immediately coming out of the war. I think prior to the war starting, peak circulation was like 350 to 500 when uh, thousand when um, the tour was going on and, and subscriptions went up. And, um, and I don't I don't have the exact number. It, 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 it generally boosted, a number of multiples from what its normal circulation was, which was in like the tens of thousands, you know, like high tens of thousands. Um, but, but, you know, uh, there was this, yeah, de Grange still viewed this monopoly on the telling of the race as the only, or as the best way to see his newspaper succeed. And, and I think it was 1921 or so when for the first time regional and foreign presses were allowed to cover the race in their own cars. And then um, in the 30s, I believe, was the first radio broadcast. But for a long time, it was just, you know, DeGrange's uh, daily editorials, um, the itinerary of the race, uh, the, the events of the race itself, and uh, across the pages of Lotto, although in that year it was somewhat limited because there were still paper quotas that, um, you know, limited what, what they could talk about at the time. So um, this very kind of cloistered environment of the, the race storytelling, which forced me to kind of, um, you know, look abroad because I, I didn't fully trust uh, his storytelling for, for, for many of the things apart from the itinerary and to tell kind of some of the basic facts of the race. But, um, you know, if you've ever read Lotto or, or DeGrange's editorials, it's, it's, you know, very lofty, um, stuff. So, um, it's epic. At right. Least. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So. Which is good, which is good because it's a tradition, in fact. You know, the storytelling of the Tour de France has always been like this. Right. Uh, in, in the 60s, when, when you had the, you know, the, the boss of the Tour de France at the time, and then uh, uh, Antoine Blondin, the journalist, uh, the talented journalist, and everything was a kind of epic. And even today, when you yep. see the TV, the, the way they film the, the race, uh, the way they show the, the, the races into descents or whatever, it's, it's always dramatic. And it's, uh, 
the, the, the epic dimension of the tour is something essential. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to when I was writing an essay recently that the tour had this, um, you know, stage guide that they put out. And for all the differences in the race itself, there is still, you know, in terms of how they describe the stages and, and whatnot, there's still, you know, that that great battle of cyclist versus environment that they're um, that they really try and build up. And I'm I'm curious, you know, Pe as a, a, a people's relationship to the cyclists themselves is more distant now. You know, cyclists are oftentimes re replaceable. Um, they're riding for international teams. And I'm curious whether that will ever have to be updated or if you have any thoughts on whether, you know, the tour kind of language will have to be updated as people's relationship to cyclists seems to grow more distant. Um, yeah, you know, the, the tour used to have its own language. Now it's French in, and English. Mm -hmm. There is no tool language like there was before. You know, the, when Tom Simpson came in the 60s to race in France, he started to learn the cyclist language before learning French because there was something special. And mm -hmm. now it's impossible. The peloton is made of people coming from everywhere in the world. You have, you know, it's a Babel Tower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have you have people speaking, you know, every language is spoken. So they do speak English now. Mm -hmm. When you give an interview, it's it's English. If if it's not English, it's it's not understandable. So this is the new dimension of the tour. It's a world event. But you know, nevertheless, I think that um, always people are eager to pick up one or the other racer and to, to make him a favorite. Mm -hmm. Even, if, he, if, even if, if he doesn't win, winning is not the, the, the only idea. Um, you know, being who you are and doing things the way you do those things, telling things the way you tell them is often enough. It's even more than to win. You know, look, People like Raymond Poulidor, uh, for example, he, he never won the, the tour. He never even wore the, new, the, the yellow jersey for one day. And he was, he's absolutely celeb, you know, a celebrity in France, even if he died a couple of years ago. And everybody is so happy because his, his grandson is right. now on the race. And so this is little poo poo, and people is very happy with that. So there is something special, and even if um, you know you can you can you can fall in love with um, a Colombian racer, you can fall in love with a um, Slovian Slovenian rider, and people do, mm -hmm. and people do. Of course, they like Alaphilippe better now these days. But you know, today Pogacar is is not hated. Mm -hmm. So there is always that mythological dimension in it, but, but mythology is made of memory. And so you, you have to let time pass mm -hmm. just to see what's gonna stay in memories, um, what people are going to pick up to make a legend of it to make a, a complete story of it. We were very lucky to have uh, races like uh, Eddie Merckx or Bernard Hinault. But of course, there is a gap in time that never happened before, except for the war. But uh, there, there's a gap in time, which is the Armstrong years. It's difficult today to build a myth and a legend uh, about Armstrong, for example. And so it's a long gap. It's a seven years gap at least. And um, it's a long gap into the story. People do not know how to talk about him. Right. I can see that. They do not know how to talk about him. He's not into memories. People want to erase him. Yeah. And it's also, uh, at least from my reporting that I did a little bit um, recently, you know, it is still affects how people, at least Americans, view their relationship to uh, putting too much faith in one cyclist with the worry that you know 
this could happen again. And, and um, so, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how, yeah, the, 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 I think in, in some ways, if you're a tour administrator, if you if you work for ASO, um, it's nice to have the event be the main attraction as opposed to an individual cyclist, because it means people don't care. You know, you can just keep hosting the race and that'll be enough for people. Um, but it does, it, 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 there's, there's something, I don't know. It, it, it's, there is an element that's unromantic about uh, having no, you know, uh, having no relationship and, and really taking, uh, you know, once all your heroes or, or what have you are gone, then, um, and you just have the, the stage or the event, I, I, I do wonder in kind of the longer arc, uh, how, how that affects what the yeah. race is like. Um, yeah. Yeah. We need heroes. But, but some people, you know, they don't need heroes. They, they need landscapes. Mm -hmm. You know, starting in the 80s when the Regis Forestier started to turn his cameras to, towards the, the, the landscape around instead of staying on the race. From that point, a lot of new people came to the Tour de France, not to watch the race, but to watch the landscape. So now it's tourism. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in incredibly powerful for friends, you know. Yep. It attracts thousands of people from yep. the, everywhere in the world. You know, I've made, when I was a kid, and my father, when I made the Ventoux, when I was climbing the Ventoux, we were alone on the road. And people were thinking that we were mad. Now you have, to, you know, it's a cute, it's line up to, you have, you have a line of 21 kilometers of, of cyclists one behind the other. This is the work of the Tour de France. Yeah. Do you think that's also one of the reasons for this kind of literary element of the race is the opportunity to focus on the landscape as opposed to the individuals? How do, how do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, it was when I was starting to work on the book, I mean, I know that um, I was glad that it was to me as, as a more distant observer of the 1919 race. I, I thought it was a good race just based on the kind of tragedy of, of Christoph. Um, but I, I, I really wanted to, Look tell, at us, the tell us, tell us a, a little about the, the tragedy of Christophe, because it's interesting. Yeah, yeah so he was a, an older cyclist at the time, given at least compared to how old the average tour winner was. Um, had been in a cycling group uh, during the war, so had, had the opportunity to be on a bike a little bit more than some of the younger cyclists who would have joined uh, line infantry units. And then, um, you know, a, a cyclocross champ and someone who well knew the, the machine of the bike, not just how to, how to ride one. And, and so he's uh, once uh, Henri Plissier, uh, abandons the race. Eugene Christoph comes to the front um, of the general classification uh, for a long period of time. I think it's maybe like the fourth or fifth stage up to the 14th stage. Mm -hmm. And then on the 14th stage, his fork breaks, which is almost the identical uh, tragedy that happened in the 1913 race, I believe. Um, and he has to walk his bike into, you know, the next town. Um, I think it's it's uh i forgot I, I forgot the exact town um and weld it back together and then you know set out on the cobblestones and finish the race and he winds up coming in third and but you know he had claimed so many people's attention by that time that uh once he dropped people just started sending money into lato and and you know saying you know just give you you chris Christoph something. Um, and he winds up, I think, uh, getting more money and prizes than, you know, the first. Than the winner, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so it, it represents that, you know, that, yeah, that as, as you mentioned, that it, that it doesn't matter to some degree who the winner is if there's a better story. 
um, or if there is a story. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're frozen. I've lost you. Oh, oh you're back. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but but that you know that idea of a story rather than just a winner is can be as compelling. Yes, it's absolutely essential. It's better to have a story than a winner. Right. Um, if the story is beautiful, <laughs> it yeah. has to be beautiful. It has to be heroic. <laughs> yes, that's nice. So that's good. Yeah. Um, so that was you know one of the first things that drew me is that kind of that environment and that very human understanding of, of success and, and seeing almost success and then not mm -hmm. quite. Yeah, so from that point of view, you were right to pick up 1919 as a good year because it was a good year, even if it was not a spectacular one, it right. was a good year. And um, the, the, the history uh, around, the history around is very, very interesting. It's a very good time. So your book is good. And so this is the book. I've, I've got it. <laughs> and I've got it. You, you've got one too? Oh, I've got really? yours. Oh, yeah, mine. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so maybe we could take a few questions, if any. Oui, absolutely. Alors. So we have a question from Jad for both Paul and Adin. Although this is a horrible subjective, how do, you, how do both of you place the current ways of the TDF, of the Tour de France, in comparison to the 1919 ways? Qualitatively, as an experience for the viewer, or this is an apple and orange question? Or is this an apple and orange Do you want to start, Paul? No, go ahead. <laughs> I think that the, the, the current race is well suited to the TV viewing experience. Um, I think it is much easier. It's, it's, you can actually watch it on TV and watch the whole stage and feel like you've seen a discrete event um, or part of an event, whereas back then it would have been impossible. You could have you would have had some people summarizing it for you. Even if you had a TV, no one would want to watch an event that started at two or three in the morning and, and ended at five at night. Um, so I think it's, it's, an, it, it, so it, it's well suited to the excitement and visual, distant visual understanding that the vast majority of people have to the Tour de France, as opposed to watching it on the side of a, of a road of seeing that one moment of of cyclist passing um i think it's you know it's it's in some ways maybe more exciting in it's, it's it's more exciting from a viewing perspective in that these are you know un, incomparable athletes uh and who are, have the support to be at the absolute top of their game whereas in 1919 you know you could have an unlucky event ruin your day. Um, so I think it's well suited to how people consume the race. Uh, and it and it's but it's less of an adventure, I guess. You know, back then it 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 really felt like an adventure in that, yes, you might have to repair your bike and you might, you know, you would be riding all day and then you might spend a day in a town and then ride all day again. And so it's more exciting. It's less adventurous, I guess, is, is this is the quick version, in my opinion. You know, the, the strange thing is that um, we are in another world, in another race, in another time for, you know, technical purposes. It's a different race, but it still is the Tour de France. And this is one of the big mystery of the, of the thing. Uh, what, what, why? Why is this Tour de France lasting like this? Even if changing more or less every year, why is it lasting like this? Why are we expecting the Tour de France every year? Why are we waiting for the Tour de France? Why are we watching the Tour de France? And why are we sad the day the Tour de France finishes and ready to wait for the next one? 
there is something very special in this. And it doesn't you works only for specialists or for bike lovers or racers themselves. It's true for thousands of people everywhere. And so there is something quite mysterious there. Pave, you can talk. You have to unmute yourself first and then you can ask your question. I thought we had a question from Bobby, but maybe it was just a mistake. Yeah. So, Albert Nicolas? Albert, Nic we have a question from Albert Nicolas, but you have to unmute yourself. You have to click on the, the little mic so that you can ask. So, your what's questions. the future of the Tour de France? And would other countries um, uh, create something equivalent? Mm -hmm. I, ca I can talk about the, the future of Tour de France because nobody knows. Uh, the future of Tour de France is uh, probably next July or next June. And um, I don't know exactly what can happen, but there will be another Tour de France. Because last year, even with the pandemic, we had the Tour de France. So I think that the avenue of the Tour de France is, um, is good. Yeah, there's no problem for that. For, uh, concerning other countries, we already have the Giro d'Italia and the Vuelta d'Espagna. Those uh, races are very well known, and uh, there are also um, Tour d'Allemagne, Tour d'Angleterre, England, Germany, uh, Switzerland. Um, there are a lot of tours like this, but of course, Tour de France is the biggest. And I think it, you know, it. I think it does well reflect that, despite all the differences in the tour, you still see some of. Even the idea of, I don't know, I, 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 despite it being such a different and international and exciting and, and, um, and, you know, changing to shape new forms of media, you still see kind of the Granja's ghost, um, you know, either pushing cyclists or, you know, he is, he is, a, despite the fact that it was someone else who came up with the idea of the tour, you know, you see his desire to constantly reinvent the race. I mean, the, the race is constant in that, you know, apart from the World Wars, it has continued. But from 1903, uh, most years, there was some minor rules shift that kind of gradually was just a tinkering to either make the race more exciting or adaptable based on you know some or another sometimes arbitrary quality sometimes real quality is that you know for all the constancy of the race there is this constant reinvention of it or or just twiddling with its gears to have it be whatever that ultimate view was in the mind of of its organizer yes there is a continuity in the tour de france you know, when you, you race the Tour de France and then you drive the cars who are running around the, the races, then you run the Tour de France. Uh, those are, you know, former cyclists are working for the Tour de France. It's a huge, it's a huge thing. You have a lot of people, very competent people. They know exactly what they have to do, what they have to create to do something new and the same at, at, the, at the same time. And this is what is the continuity and, and at the same time, the invention of new forms of new games. And this is what makes the Tour de France uh, durable. Yeah. Has 
anyone want to ask a question? That's, that's a moment. So you can either type it or I can then raise your hand and I'll un unmute you. No? I have a question for you, Paul. So you asked me at, in, when we were chatting a little bit via email whether you thought, whether I thought the, the 1919 race happened too soon. And I'm curious if you thought it happened too soon. Yep. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> no, I think that's um, Tour de France is life again. Mm -hmm. It's regular life again. See, this year, here in France, you know, we just finished the, the first, maybe the third, you know, I don't know exactly where we are, you know, mm. according to, to, to the, the, you know, the TV and all this. We don't know exactly where the pandemic is, but the Tour de France is right. here. And so this is life again. This is life restarting. So I think that 1919 was a very good choice. It was a very good choice, a difficult choice, a dangerous choice, you know, a, a difficult race, but it was a good choice. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is another one question. Last yeah. question. Yes, from Jad. Do the Italians, for example, feel the same loyalty, honor about the Giro as the French do the Tour? It's not my area uh -huh. of expertise. I, you know, I think the the defining quality of the Tour de France is in that even. Now, in particular, there's an international audience that, um, you know, as Paul mentioned, are not even necessarily close followers of cycling at all, but rather know the tour. And I think, you know, for all the, the, the French loyalty there is for the race, I think one of the amazing things about the race is the number of people it draws in, particularly now, and, and that, you know, people who may not tune into any other cycling race in a year tune in to the Tour de France day after day. And I realize that's a cop-out answer to the question, but it, I think that is one of the amazing things about the race is that it, you know, there is some element, some perhaps indefinable element of it that still brings people who don't care about cycling into the race. I'm, I'm sure Italian people are very fond of their Giro d'Italia, of course. They have to be, and they are. It's a lovely race too. And same thing for, for Spain. But um, it's not exactly like the Tour de France. I think that because, because simply, um, I think that the racers would trade one stage, one win on the stage of the Tour de France for three in the Giro. And this is the reason why you know, the Tour de France is a very, very big international event. Um, I, Giro is as well, but it's not summer. Giro is more spring. It's not vacation time. Tour de France is vacation time. It's sun time. And it's, you know, yellow is the sun. It's, it's the color of the paper. Lotto, the paper of Lotto was yellow. And this is the reason why he, he created the yellow jersey. But um, yellow is the sun. And uh, Tour de France is summer, it's vacation again. And so this is the reason why it's very successful too. But I'm sure it's uh, very, people are very proud in Italy. And I watched the Giro as well. I watched the Spain, the Tour of Spain as well. <laughs> they come up. <laughs> so we have uh, Uh, we have a last question from uh, an anonymous attendee. If you could project into the minds of the cyclists, do you think their perseverance was based on personal, like overcoming the battle scars of war for the country, or what was their primary driving force to keep them going in this devastated land? Please, go into the head of the races. <laughs> I, I mean, I think one of the the unique qualities of cycling as a sport, and I, I forgot to bring this up earlier, but, you know, I think Paul well documents in Need for the Bike is that, you know, 
cycling and the bicycle can be can have this intimate relationship to people that other objects of sports don't have because there's always there can always be this practical element of owning and riding a bike or just like a a pleasurable element as well as an athletic element and you know so I do think you know as far as the site and I think that factors into how the cyclists viewed their relationship to the sport itself is that it was you know, more than just a professional activity, but it was a lifestyle and an avocation. And, and for most of them, there were months where they had other jobs. They were mechanics or owned bike shops or what have you. And I think that gestures to the fact that, I, you know, yes, these people were getting out of uniform weeks before sometimes, but, um, it was an opportunity to go back to this old way of life as well as, you know, winning prize money and being supported by a, by a team. But, you know, it was this way of doing this thing that they loved and which they also happened to be paid for, but it was, you know, not just like competed. It, it was not some soulless competition for them, but it was really their lives. And I think that is at least part of the reason why people chose to go through this punishment is is that it's more than you know just uh just a, an event having a bike is being a faster man and the tour de france answers the question how fast so that's it and you know that's that's a way of life really you're right andy Edin. this is re this is really a way of life and in 1919, it was pretty slow, fastest man, but, but, um, or at least comparison not, to today. Not but. so slow, <laughs> not so slow. When you think of the mud on the road, when you think of the, you yeah. know, those heavy bikes, the after war heavy bikes, right. they were not so slow. They were expecting to run 28, 30 kilometers per hour. They were running maybe 22, 23, right. which is, which is still fast. But now, you know, you have 45, 50 kilometers an hour. Yes, yes. This is how fast we can go now. Yeah. If, if you're strong, if you're young, <laughs> and if you're a cyclist, a yeah. trained cyclist, you can go as fast as 70 kilometers, 90, more than 100 kilometers per hour. The other day in the descent of the Ventoux, mm. 107 kilometers per hour on those tires. Yeah. 23 millimeters wide. Okay. It takes some guts. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have the descent speeds from the 1919 race, but if you look on the, you know, the Alpine roads and what they looked like back then where there, you know, often weren't guardrails of any sort. And I forgot there was some year it was in the thirties where someone fell off one of the, the Alpine descents, I think, and, and wound up dying and, and, so, you know, yes, I, yes, it was, it, they were slower, but, you know, just as, uh, just as brave for, for going down those dirt roads, um, as fast as they could with, uh, you know, with little stopping them from potentially flying off if, uh, you know, they hit a rock or something. So, uh, Alba Nicola, do you, you have an, another, another question or was it still... You kept your hand raised. I, I don't know. I haven't. Anyway, if if you want to if if you can if you want to speak, it's the floor is yours. They they essentially thank you so much uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity. Uh, we missed the beginning. I'm sorry. <laughs> the speed of the bike is an amazing element in the Tour de France. And it's so scary, as they just mentioned, that you make a little um, error and it can cost you a lot. So, um, and the technology of biking now is getting amazingly amazing that people can go faster and faster, but that there's gonna be any limit or it's gonna be like that? Who knows? Who knows, okay. <laughs> it's scary, 
it's very scary. Yes, it's scary, it's scary. But at the same time, you know, the, the bikes are improving year after year. They have better brakes. Um, you know, you never know. You never know what can happen. One day, maybe it will stop. And then we will start all over again. Although, you know, one of the interesting things you are seeing is as cyclists become better trained and faster and the bikes become faster, that, you know, there are, that is creating new dilemmas in the race. But, you know, this year's uh, first stage, you, you saw, you know, an awful crash that was, you know, all the more awful because of the, cl you know, the closest of the Peloton combined with the speeds people are going these days. And, and it'll be interesting to see, um, I forgot following whether uh, this year's cyclist protest, whether there were particular things they were asking the administrators to do. But I know that there was talk of, you know, splitting up the group or things like that in order to make it more manageable for those people who are going faster and faster every year and more and more competitive in some ways every year and, and whether some of those rules have to change, even if they're still going faster and faster, just to make the race more accommodating for those speeds. So, merci infiniment, Paul merci. and Adin. Thank you so, so much. It was so interesting and a wonderful way to kick up summer and our summer holiday um, the talk will be we will post this, the talk will be available on our website i hope for the end of the tour it will be our way to celebrate the end of the tour de france this year and we'll share it on facebook next weekend um, so yes so if you have friends who have missed this the opportunity to listen to Paul and Adin, they will have other occasion uh, later to, to review this conversation. We're really, really thrilled. Um, we hope we'll have a, another occasion to, to invite you again, Paul and Adin, to discuss sport, literature, cyclism, and many other topics. We wish you a lovely summer, and thank you again.